Hello, my Juicy Co-Creators. Lilou here. I'm in Stockholm today on this actually very last day in Stockholm. Uh, we're going to talk about Zen yes. with you, Sante. Hello. Thank you for uh, joining Hello. me here. Thank you. Thank you for letting me <laughs> come and have this yeah. last moment interview. Yeah, this last minute interview. And uh, this is a significant one because we're going to talk about Zen. Zazen. What is Zazen? Zazen means seated meditation. Uh, sa means sitting. Mm -hmm. Zen means meditation. So, so Zen means meditation in, uh, in Japanese, um, but it you know it comes from Chinese Shan, which also means meditation, which is the Chinese attempt to say Jhana, which is Indian Sanskrit for meditation. So it's it's all mean meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're, you're part of this, uh, one of the, I guess, the, the founding members, if I could say, or teachers of this uh, Zen garden. That, and there's lots of location, uh, mainly from my understanding, in uh, around Scandinavia, but also in Germany, Glasgow. And so there's those retreat centers, or those retreats called Shishin. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Oh, my Japanese is getting good. Uh, Soon first I will first be in Japan. Se, and then Shin. Se, Shin. Se, Shin. And um, I'm myself very attracted to the Japanese culture, I must say, their respect for life and uh, the way they live. What brought uh, you to, to, to this uh, lifestyle? Because it's more than just a practice, isn't it? No, it's a lifestyle. Uh, I mean, to me, it's a life. Yeah. I've been doing this for 30 years, um, more or less uh, full time, more or less. Um, so it's really been my life. I can hardly remember why I started, yeah. uh, but you know, it's. Uh, I was not interested in Japanese culture, at all. Uh, it that was not the reason why I started this. Uh, I think it was more existential questioning, and uh, by chance or faith or karma or whatever, I just happened to pick up a book when I was like 16 that, from a library that taught me how to actually sit and do some meditation and I tried and it helped me somewhat and uh, and then um, I think it was I 1982 there was this uh, Zen master visiting Sweden uh, an American named Philip Kaplow and uh, it was kind of a big deal uh, and I was not very sure if I would even go um, but I finally went and uh, and I was very impressed by him, and so I, I very soon started to sort of give up, almost not give up, but I was an artist to be. I was, you know, had a studio. I was doing a lot of painting, and uh, had a tiny bit of success with that. Um, thought of that as my life. I was always been very interested in art, drawing and painting, but then um, this kind of took over, and. Uh, Soon I moved to Rochester, New York, where this master had a temple uh, center and um, stayed there for a few years. And, and then just the years just rolled by. Mm -hmm. And then 1991, I was ordained as a Zen Buddhist priest. And in 1998, I was um, asked to teach by my then teacher. Um, my first teacher, Kapler Roshi, had retired. and. His successor was his name is Bodin Coley, mm -hmm. also American. Um, he asked me if I wanted to teach in Sweden, which I started doing. So, are you a Lama? We don't call it Lama. We call it uh, uh, the the Japanese term is Sensei, uh, which means literally uh, uh, one who walks ahead. Uh, so it's sort of a you know like a guide or a, uh, but it. it, it it does mean teacher, mm -hmm. so it's a teacher. Um, and uh, a master is someone who, you know, you have, I'm a teacher, I'm a Zen teacher, that's what I call myself, but to be, you know, a master is someone who has disciples, so only a disciple will call me a master. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if you say a Zen master, which is very common you hear in, in mm -hmm. 
English language, it sounds a little bit weird. It sounds like, you know, like a sports champion. <laughs> because we use the word master in this way in, in the English language. Yeah. And in the Swedish, it's not... Yeah. yeah. But it's seen also, it could be seen in a negative way too for some people. And I must say, I have recently done a video about this uh, as to uh, the, the, the difference masters you know guru some are the incarnated one and it can be and some people a little bit abuse of that too and it can be scary and uh, it's it can be manipulative too so what's your view on uh, what's a master and uh, yeah. what what is for you something that you you look for in your master for example yeah well i think to you know when i met captain roshi he he was to me uh my master I don't think he ever thought I'm a master because uh, he was very unassuming and uh, and uh, was very extremely proud when someone mistook him for the janitor at the center where he was teaching because um, he wasn't uh, interested in that kind of stuff. But for me, a master is someone that you connect with so deeply that you feel that I can trust this person. Mm -hmm. um, a teacher is more like someone who instructs you, like, like you know, a professor at the university might teach you things, but I don't think you would consider that <laughs> that relationship so close. But it could become, and if it becomes really close, like uh, like intimate almost, like something that you you trust each other and you you help each other and you. Uh, and it is natural too. Then then it I think it becomes natural that you see that person as your master, mm -hmm. but people who go around and say I'm the master or I'm a guru or um, I'm quite suspicious of you know in Buddhism usually not in Tibetan Buddhism has this concept of gurus and lamas uh, well a lama is actually just a teacher uh, but uh, gurus you know where you have a spiritual guru I uh, it's not that I'm not against it at all but uh, I think in generally in Buddhism you talk about Kalyana Mitra, which means spiritual friend. So it's more like you develop a kind of a, a relationship with someone, and you and one is guiding the other because one has walked ahead. Mm -hmm. Someone is has more experience, and then you can help each other. Um, but I I see it when I have students. I see that the students are helping me <laughs> as much as I am helping them mm -hmm. because it is a relationship. It's a, you know then it two people. Mm -hmm. There's always a back and forth of uh, uh, experience. Um, mm -hmm. So so yes, and I. And we're all humans. <laughs> I mean, basically, we all you know this blood and this. It's the same. It's the same. Uh, so no, it's no difference between. Uh, essentially, there's no difference between people at all, and uh, actually, the Buddha was also a human being. Yeah. Uh, he lived, he breathed, and died. Um, and uh, I think that there is a risk when you go into, which we always <laughs> worry about, is that when you go into spiritual practice, uh, and it's not just in the West, it happens very much in the East also, that you there is a worship. Yeah. Um, you know, you put something on a pedestal, you know, like, very high especially up. in the east huh? I think especially in the east yeah. and it's so strongly connected with senses of uh, like uh, filial duty you know the the idea of like how you trust your parents and the mm. state the and respect uh, respect yeah. very very strong overwhelming respect you never speak badly about your elders you know you never uh, question you never look uh, and this is I, I think this is um, a curse of well uh, not just Zen or Buddhism even it's it's a curse of all uh, spiritual uh, practice and and all religion um, it's quite um, and then the people like uh, uh, kind of those people g we it's easy to get trapped and all of us in all our lives can easily get trapped around this identification or yeah. those labels and uh, and then coming clean and being authentic and uh, mm. uh, saying what's really going on because we all make mistakes is, is an essential one. Especially right now, I feel as there's a lot of cleanup that are being done in all areas, mm -hmm. uh, in the economy and uh, the banking system and the government. And uh, 
uh, but also in spirituality. Yeah? Right. Absolutely. And I think that, um, well, my view on <laughs> spirituality, I think it's a very <laughs> difficult word. Yeah. Um, and I think there is two, wh wh as what I see now is that there are two problems uh, in facing um, people practicing in the West. And I think it's, well, I, what I know about is mostly Buddhism, of course. Um, but, you know, one is that you, you cling to tradition. And uh, because tr tradition has its, I mean, obvious values. There, there, uh, in my mind, there are values in tradition. There's values in uh, lineage, in, in uh, let's call it wisdom and knowledge passed down from generation to generation. There is some value to that. Um, but what happens, I, <coughs> I think, very often is that people, you know, it's like when you're a Buddhist, you're, you are walking in the footsteps of the Buddha. That's the idea. But people get obsessed by the footsteps <laughs> and, you know, walking exactly uh, and forgetting that why, if you, if you are inspired by the example of the Buddha, why did he walk those steps at all? He did it because he was on a spiritual quest. And you can't just follow him. Because if you just follow in the footsteps, then it's not a spiritual quest. Yeah. You're just a conformist. You're just trying to be follow the rules and regulations and structures and and then power and all kinds of issues comes in um, and I think this is a big problem in Buddhism and not the least in the East mm. and not the least in Japan mm. uh, I've seen many examples of that um, so so then people have sort of I guess rebelled a little bit against this especially in the West uh, trying to find their own spiritual empowerment uh, or empowering themselves um, and uh, finding the Buddha in us yeah. yes of course <laughs> which is exactly what the Buddha was talking about you what know. was his profound message that the well <laughs> you know he he said be a light unto yourself uh, be? a light unto yourself yeah. uh, do not follow others uh, he even said, you know, do not uh, listen to or believe in things just because teachers, masters, prophets, uh, elders, parents uh, says it is so, but examine in your own heart whether it is true or not. Uh, and, and then you just hear this big crowd of Buddhists saying, yes! <laughs> it's like in this Brian, <laughs> this uh, Monty Python movie, Life of Brian, where where this uh, <laughs> guru is in front of a big crowd saying, don't follow me, and everybody's chanting in unison, yes, don't follow me, <laughs> 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 because they don't get it. Yeah. Um, but in Zen, there's always been this strong emphasis on, you know, you, you have to eat the food yourself uh, to know how it tastes. Uh, you can't just read menus. It doesn't satisfy hunger. Um, you have to drink the water to yourself to ascertain whether it's cold or warm. So uh, it is a personal spiritual quest. And uh, in my feeling, experience, uh, of course I never met the Buddha, literally, but it seems from his teaching that he was really, in a sense, he was a spiritual, he was an individualist, maybe the first one, um, because religion in that time was very much concerned with, you know, the case, caste system, mm -hmm. you know, and you are born into, yeah. like most people these days, they're born into being Christians or Muslims or Jews or Buddhists. Uh, it's, it's not really a personal questioning. And, and I think this suits the power of religion, I mean, the institution of religion, because then you have a group of people, the majority, who never questions anything, um, well, we see it in Christianity and Judaism and I'm sure in Buddhism as well. Oh, everywhere. Yeah. All uh, religions are kind of crumbling. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, and I think this is one of the reasons, because people now want to question and find like their own mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is very good, but <laughs> 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 there is a but. <laughs> uh, there is a but, and the but is that there is a, I think there is a, what I see sometimes is the sort of the opposite kind of risk because what happens with this f the first thing I mentioned now about how you 
how religion just makes you conform and uh, not think for yourself, not question for yourself, not search inside yourself. You say, the priest can take care of that. It's good, you know. I, I just be, I'm just a believer, yeah. uh, which is kind of ridiculous, um, but it also fosters kind of laziness yeah. because it's very lazy way of living. You know, I don't have to care. Um, but I think this very personalized or individualized spirituality that we see growing everywhere also fosters a kind of a laziness sometimes because it uh, <coughs> maybe it's because of um, media <laughs> or maybe it is because of um, the our own laziness too. Yeah, uh, yeah we have this i think a uh, victim mode of being yeah uh, and um, and that's how we were born into and that's okay but there's there's a lot of work to do about that to stand up a hundred yeah. responsible for our life and not put it in the hands of a text or yeah. or a person because we are the one that are making those choices and we need to wake up i think this is the awakening yeah is part of waking up to this reality and to what really life is about and how powerful we are and yet how um, uh, how powerful the universe how is seriously and, mysterious, and yeah. powerful the universe is but what happens sometimes is i think that uh, spirituality in this modern sense becomes because it's so individualized it becomes uh, a commodity you know some yeah. it becomes something you can si buy and sell yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, and that people, because it is turned into something that's packaged very uh, in for the individual to consume, uh, it also has to become, not always, but sometimes, uh, more superficial because there is uh, commercialization, there is a market force, you know, that says, well, let's say, let's say I look at the internet and I'm interested in spiritual growth. Uh, maybe I want enlightenment, let's say, and I look. I'm going to buy a diploma for yeah. enlightenment. And you see, okay, <laughs> this guy, he offers enlightenment in three days. Yeah. This, this tradition, these guys, they say you have to work for th the rest of your life and maybe you won't even get it. So which one should I buy? Yeah. So, so I think this is... Uh, we want it now. We want it now and we want <laughs> it for ourselves and it's supposed to help us. Which is fine, uh, but that's not really... You know, when you open up to uh, to awakening or enlightenment, it's not about yourself. It's about uh, that which is not yourself, which is bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, yourself is like a snowflake <laughs> compared to this. Uh, but it starts from there. It has to start from there. But I think that sometimes what happens is that people, because of this privatization of religion or spirituality, mm -hmm. uh, never go beyond actual um, so it, it becomes a kind of a consumption I do a little bit of power yoga I do a little bit of qigong I do a little bit of shamanic things and th absolutely nothing wrong with that because there is a smorgasbord of, yeah. of options and possibilities uh, but I still now <laughs> only coming from my own example I still believe somehow that if you want to go deep you you do it is helpful if you can focus your mind enough to do, to go into something, mm -hmm. to sort of dig where you are yeah. instead of just running around and yeah. sort of sampling things. Yeah. So, so this is, I think, uh, the other kind of laziness that appears, that you just lazily think, yes, I'm spiritual, I do, you know, I've yeah. done a little bit of this. I once even went to a retreat and it was really nice. Uh, so this is a danger, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, it's dangerous to make too quickly a decision as well yeah. because it's good to, to sample and taste and see so that then uh, when something really resonates, yeah. you know for sure from experience. So I think there's a different perspective and the main thing it comes down to is listen to your heart. Maybe earlier on in your life, you will feel that calling and you want to deepen your practice with a particular technique and uh, and train of thoughts and maybe a different life there is different uh, I, I think there's so many possibilities like there is an infinite po number of possibilities and you can uh, I, I agree and um, I, I was once in a like a seminar with the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala this is many years ago um, and uh, someone asked about this and he said that he thought it was very good with this smergos board of 
spiritual choices um, because it because before he said before you choose your guru um, you should uh, spy on him for at least seven years <laughs> uh, which I think is quite good I mean I don't think people need to choose a guru actually I think um, you know people who become my students personal students um, I feel that yes as long as they want to work with me I'll work with them but they're free they're free they can change their mind you know it's like I sometimes say yes it's like a marriage but you can divorce at any time you want mm -hmm. and I will not feel bad about it I have I will have no hard feelings uh, because I, I think it is important that people feel that they can move on and there are I think there's actually very few people who will stay who will have this kind of one-track mind that I have <laughs> or have had uh, who can stay within a tradition um, for 30, 40 years or whatever. Uh, but, but what happens if you do that, if you stay with one path, then you will can find that, yes, but I am free inside of this. I can, I can explore. You know, I can go to... I can, I can be a Zen Buddhist and still um, do tarot, you know, <laughs> or something else. I can, I can learn and I can grow and I can develop by taking in many different things. Mm -hmm. And uh. it doesn't mean uh, betraying or none of that. No. It's life is so open and yeah. so big and so vast. But betrayal comes from, uh, you know, when you betray something, uh, well, if it's a cult or, you know, then, then betraying, then betraying is a big deal. You know, as soon as you betray something or you say, I want to leave, they go crazy and they, <laughs> they uh, kick you out or they start to follow you or try to get your money <laughs> uh, or your life or whatever. But if it's not a cult, if it's just some benign path you're walking, then uh, I think betraying it is very difficult. I mean, because betrayal then just means you're betraying yourself, your, your innermost feeling or what you really want to do um, but still you know when what happens when people work in sand when they work with a teacher or a master they they will come up on you know difficulties yeah. within themselves and win within the relationship uh, and uh, the teacher is not just nice you know that's uh, <laughs> I think uh, it's like sometimes there's tough love or strong being yeah. strong for a teacher yeah. so that that person can see yeah and sometimes that means that the peop th that you will be hurt you know or you will uh like someone said to me when i talked with someone this is many years before i became a teacher but there was a guy who who had been practicing <laughs> zen buddhism for many years and he said about choosing your master or your teacher he said that well I tended, when I had a choice between two people I both respected and thought would, could really help me, uh, I chose the one that irritated me the most because I thought that would be probably more helpful for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was something with that person that sort of yeah. you know, irritated yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is, can be very helpful. And uh, you know, my, my first teacher, Kapil Roshi, said it's like, uh, having a, it's like putting a piece of sand inside an oyster and the... the the oyster are irritated by this piece of sand, so it becomes a pearl, you know, it covers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that a certain amount of pain or struggle or difficulty m is uh, yeah. part of a yeah. spiritual path. And yet it can go very far. I've seen some Chinese master really scream at others and, and put them in position like, you bow now and you do this. And <gasps> is, this, is, this is this good? No. That's, uh, well... There's boundaries. Huh? I think maybe in, in Chinese or Japanese culture, which is very feudal, at least Japanese culture, which I know better, um, still have this feudal kind of lord vessel. I think for those who are brought up in that system, that tradition, maybe it works. Maybe it's just, um, mm -hmm. maybe they don't take it so seriously. <coughs> I don't know. But uh, for Westerners, it definitely doesn't work. And I also see an example of how uh, maybe not that strong, but I've seen examples of how how the system becomes like uh, you know it becomes like English boarding schools. It's it's penalistic, yeah. you know. You the the elders punish the youngers all the time, and uh, not always the teacher. The teacher 
might be very friendly and benign, but he is sort of removed from all this stuff. So it is like the middle management <laughs> who always puts down in, uh, in I think, a really penalistic uh, mm -hmm. atmosphere that mm -hmm. can be terrible. So, no, w <laughs> I'm very much... Uh, I'm really trying not to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. But it's it's a very interesting conversation, I think, to have, especially uh, in this in this time. And uh, and I, I really appreciate your thoughts and, and your openness in this conversation, so we can talk about it because this uh, this is very much aligned with the video I just did uh, um, about all this, and uh, just so that people. Uh, have warnings too, because when we're new at something, sometimes we embarked into seminars when they force people to sign up or put peer pressure or super, super high expensive way outside the budgets and there's credit cards that start flying. I mean, it's there's a lot of practices that I really feel are not appropriate anymore. And uh, a lot of people need to say no to that right now, otherwise it will continue. And, it, and, it, and unfortunately, it, it tarnishes uh, the... The, the the beauty uh, of the of the of spirituality. Yeah, yeah. I mean that happens also, and I mean that happens in in, I think traditional religious context, yeah. but it also happens outside of it. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, quite a lot. I think there are these sort of, uh, I won't say self-made gurus, but people who, <laughs> not least Americans, uh, mm -hmm. who does become, gurified. Uh, by some experience, for example, or something, or they, they met some Indian guru, or they, they have this power, and they are empowered to teach for some reason, uh, even either self-proclaimed <laughs> or by someone else, yeah. but they just go astray, and, uh, and I think you, you have to be careful. My, my Kepler Roche used to say, what you should be aware or uh, worried about, what you should look for as warning signs for uh, in teachers or masters or gurus, is an over concern with money, your money, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, an over concern with fame and name that so that you always sort of uh, go to the biggest, you make the biggest displays of yourself. You know, there should be big crowds, and you should yeah. ideally you should come down in a helicopter <laughs> throwing flowers and yeah. then land and you yeah. smile, you know, yeah. and 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 stay away from your students as much as possible because uh, as long as you keep the distance, it's very easy to be gurified because you don't see anything bad in the person you don't know. Yeah. Uh, and then the third warning sign is that is sex. You know, if, they, if the teacher just wants to get into your pants all the time, that's prob yeah. probably a big problem. Well, <laughs> I was interviewing somebody yesterday uh, that followed for quite some time Mahachi. In the but he was a celibate monk, but in fact he was not, because he had many many women, and she's one of the women that came out, yeah. and so we had a bit of this conversation about preaching something when on the other end, you know, yeah. unfortunately yeah. they're not walking the talk, <laughs> and they're having plenty of women. Uh oh, <laughs> it's an old problem in uh, Buddhism also, I think. I mean, and and of course Catholic Church, yeah. we all know heard about all these problems. Um, that comes with celibacy, maybe, but I also think just with with power. Um, so, so these are things I think you should be careful about when when looking into teachings and and I think also when people talk about gurus and and masters and and how wonderful they are, um, I usually think that the <laughs> the best if you want to have a guru. The best thing is if the guru has been dead for at least a couple of hundred years, oh. because <laughs> you know. Then things come out when they're dead. Yeah, because then uh, and you know they, they can't do anything more wrong to you. Uh, you can just have them as an icon, you know, like like Jesus Christ uh, or someone that you just are deeply, deeply inspired by, um, and might be like uh, something that you you take into your own. It's it's really you, and this is I think what what we always. In my tradition, we emphasize is that the, the real master is yourself. It's in your own heart. Mm -hmm. uh, you are the Buddha. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything else is projection. You project onto this world you see around you, things, and, and then you might believe that, oh, but if I go to India or if I go there, then I can meet this person that is enlightened. Uh, then I will be. Yes, then I will be. I will. And then you become... <laughs> 
which I think happens very often in people in in, in sects and cults and, and guru worship uh, where it goes too far, is that they become like, uh, you know, the, the guru is like the sun that shines and the people are like satellites, like the moon or planets, that, and they circle around and as long as they are closed, they are also enlightened. The, the sh light shines on them and they feel empowered or blessed or whatever. Uh, but when they leave, they suddenly become into the darkness because they haven't realized that you have to be your own light. You have to be, mm -hmm. you have to find the sun inside yourself, mm -hmm. not trust or just stay in the reflection of someone else. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a very deep wish for this in, um, <coughs> I think maybe in the West, not the least, by people who, who go into spirituality, they are looking for someone that can shine their light yeah. upon them and they don't, so I again, it becomes laziness. Yeah, and it's always outside, outside, yeah. and it's this yeah. uh, search outside of us when all is here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a process. Let's talk about your book that you published, uh, that was published a few years ago. Yes. Uh, this was uh, kind of a love child of mine. Uh, it's it's called The Net of Indra. Um, and uh, I wrote it, uh, it took me like a couple of years, but I did only write, I actually did actual writing during five weeks uh, in solitude in Portugal. Um, I stayed there in the winter just to write it down, but I had done. And it deals with rebirth, uh, the concept of rebirth in Buddhism. And with the idea that that I was kind of inspired by a, a Japanese Zen master named Hakuin, who one he lived in the 17th century, and there was a man who came to him and said, "What happens when we die?" And Hakuin said, "I don't know." And this man said, "But you're a you're a Zen master, for Christ's sake! No, <laughs> but you're a <laughs> <laughs> you're a Zen master. Yeah. You should know." And Hakuin said, "Well." A Zen master I might be, but I'm not a dead one. Um, so I I decided I wanted to write, because there are books about reincarnation and rebirth that are really just based on faith. You know, that either there's a lama or someone who writes, and it, it, it's just saying this is how it is. This is what happens in the bardo. This is what happens between lives. This is da-da-da-da. Or there are people who are channeling information, um, and it's not that I'm saying that's wrong or bad, but it's it becomes like word f of authority. Like, oh, I have to believe this mm -hmm. because this is channeled by someone or this is a lama who's saying this. Uh, and I thought, well, I don't actually know. So I want to write from a more modern perspective uh, to people who might think, well, maybe there is something to this whole concept of rebirth, maybe when I die, I will become someone else, but I don't know. And uh, is it even possible to think that or believe that with what we know about biology, Darwinism, the brain? You know, most scientists who study the brain think that when we die, we just poof. You know, the brain is like the liver. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Or the heart. Well, there are some brilliant scientists like um, Dr. Mario Beauregard that I yes. interviewed. Uh, that that uh, that thank God explained that uh, that the brain and the consciousness are two separate things. Yeah. Yeah. So so I was interested in that, and I tried to. Well, I interviewed a couple of before I started working on the book. I interviewed a couple of brain scientists from Karolinska in this Institute here in Stockholm, mm. and got their sort of quite mainstream view. They would not agree with Borgard. Um, but then I also interviewed other people. There's a Adrian Parker, is a parapsychologist, works in Göteborg University. Um, and I talked with sort of a little bit more alternative points of view. And I, I tried to understand this from, from different sort of levels, how you can look at science, because I, I realized that, that science is not one voice when it comes to these matters. There are uh, discontent, there are people like Borgard, but there are actually many others who has alternative views. And they're not into the materialism yeah, science. They're yeah. They're not materialist, basically. They are, they are at least open to the possibility that there is something yeah. ex 
something else going on and that this materialist track that science is in might be a mistake, mm -hmm. uh, might be a dead end. Uh, Can evolve. <laughs> <laughs> but what I felt is like, you know, if you have a path that a majority of scientists, I think, in the world actually, uh, for example, neuroscientists, a, a clear majority believes that the brain is the producer of consciousness. End of period. So when the brain dies, consciousness disappears. Uh, and they just don't, it's not just that they believe it, they, they think that anything else is nonsense. Uh, nonsensical, impossible, just ridiculous. How could you be so stupid to believe something else? Um, and I was very curious, why, why, how can it be that you can have such a, how can you be so convinced? And I, I found, um, I think, many reasons, but one reason, mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, I call it, but I didn't make up that term, I call it scientism, which is kind of the religion of materialistic sciences uh, where where you sort of you have turned science into a belief system rather than a method you know of exploration and uh, and that has become very strong in our culture and and if you are completely uh, sort of inside that paradigm or thinking um, then alternative views becomes literally nonsense to you it's not just that that's probably not true, or but it becomes impossible. And I, um, I think, for example, when, as a historical example from uh, earlier era, when you know when Galilei made his telescope uh, in the 16th century or whatever, and he looked out on the stars or the sky and he saw something different, mm -hmm. uh, he he realized that okay, so the Earth is not flat. It actually is a ball that circles around the sun together with other balls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when he said that to people uh, in his time, they it was not just that they thought it was wrong; they thought it was nonsense. They they, they thought it, it was they were so convinced because everyone knew that the world is flat. I mean, you they it wasn't just uh, a belief; it was a knowledge, and it was like. Self-evident, you just look around, you see everything is flat, you know, there's a little bit of mountains and above there's this dome sky and uh, everyone knew that this must be the truth. So if you say something else, something as ridiculous as we actually live on a globe that circle in nothingness, they think that's nonsense, mm -hmm. that's schizophrenic talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and I think th something similar is going on in today that some things are termed nonsense um, because it's unintelligible to people who are completely stuck in a materialistic worldview. Mm -hmm. They can't see outside it. It's almost impossible. Um, and uh, The same way that uh, religion uh, could be too much stuck in dogmas yeah. and uh, not see what's outside. Yeah. Exactly. And then fight and have wars. Yes. And I know in the United States there is a kind of a war between science and religion. Uh, going on on different levels, some very stupid, superficial levels, some, I think, quite intelligent. Um, but there is a conflict going on, and it's, I think it's a stupid conflict uh, in the sense that science is a very powerful tool. That uh, So I met, through the course of writing this book, I came into contact with people that are scientists, like Dean Radin is an American Scientist who written many books, uh, Entangled Minds is one of them, and he's a parapsychologist. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I met other people like that who I think has more mm, a broader view and has been brave enough to uh, encounter nonsense. Because I think <laughs> you know this is this is the value of nonsense that uh, if if your worldview <coughs> is completely stuck, so you can't see outside of it, then the only way to go outside of it is through nonsensical things, like stupid things, like wild thoughts. Uh, uh, out of the box, yeah. Yes. And it's very hard to get out of the box if you're inside the box, mm -hmm. except if you are prepared to go almost to these crazy levels of thoughts. So I, <laughs> I, I sometimes say that, like in the Alice in Wonderland, that you should believe at least a few impossible things before breakfast. You know, you should... Uh, because sometimes people ask me, what do you believe in? And I say, I believe in anything. 
I'm prepared to believe in anything, at least, at least for a little mm. moment, to sort of open the possibility that, well, maybe it is so. Um, and So rebirthing, you were able to, uh, reincarnation, you were able to see it? I thought I, through this book, I could find myself saying that, yes, this is, because I do have some memories from that came up in meditation from what I th think is possibly previous lifetimes and uh, I think it makes sense um, so uh, even though it is nonsensical from certain points of view um, I th from other points of view it's not nonsensical at all uh, so if you get outside of the box you can find that it's um, really something uh, that might be literally true and this is what I think I believe. I mean, I not to think I believe, I do believe it, but in the book I'm not trying to push for it. I'm just saying, um, you know, you can open your mind yes. and be open to the possibility yes. that this is happening. And, and if it is so, then what would that mean? Yes. What would it mean to you? What would it mean in your life, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when you make choices? And, uh, yeah, it takes it to another level. <laughs> another level. But still, I'm open for, you know, I, I can, if someone says, I've seen a UFO, I will not say that can't be so. I say, oh, that's interesting. Can you show me or <laughs> can you describe it? Or if someone says, talks about ghosts or, uh, you know, I'm open to almost anything. My, um, my grandmother on my father's side was a shaman. Uh, she was half Lapish and uh, she lived, worked as a shaman her whole life. I mean, like a, which I guess you could call it. Uh, so I think through her and through that, mm -hmm. I, I feel like there is endless possibilities. And uh, what we usually see of the world, except like in depth of meditation through maybe awakening experiences or trance states or, or sometimes even in dreams and things like that, uh, what we see is just a tiny fraction. Uh, we see like the tip of the iceberg and we make the wrong assumption that this is it. This is the light. And it's Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, captivating uh, oh, moment, oh. Sante. I loved it. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, it was delightful yeah. and a great way to, to end this uh, magnificent trip mm -hmm. for me throughout uh, Scandinavia. And uh, I wish you lots of beautiful, joyful, uh, full-hearted moments in yeah. your life. Thank you. You too. <laughs> <laughs> Much you. love, my delicious co-creators from Stockholm. Bye-bye. <laughs>